This is the new way we work from Fast Company Magazine, where we take listeners on a journey through the changing landscape of our work lives and explain exactly what we need to build the future we want. I'm Fast Company Deputy Editor Kate Davis. To say that the labor market has been confusing for the last few years may be an understatement. The first months of the pandemic saw some of the most dramatic job losses in a generation. But then, a year later, employers were grappling with the great resignation and crippling labor shortages. Now, even amid the rhetoric around trendy terms like quiet quitting and the growing support for labor unions, there are near-daily headlines about a looming recession, volatile markets, and mass layoffs at tech companies. According to a recent labor report, there are about 2 million people either short or long-term unemployed right now. There may be some lessons to learn from the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009, but the world of work is a very different place than it was 15 years ago. So how do you prepare for a looming recession and the possibility of layoffs? Is there such a thing as a recession-proof job? To help me answer those questions is Amanda Augustine. Amanda is an expert in career advancement ranging from developing one's own professional brand to acing job interviews. She's a speaker and contributor to many publications, including Fast Company, and has served as a career expert for Top Resume since 2015. Amanda, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Kate. I appreciate it. So we've been seeing layoffs already at some tech companies. Are there any other industries that are kind of more at risk for layoffs in a recession than others? And are there any kind of relatively, quote unquote, safe industries? It's a great question. I don't think there is such a thing as a complete recession-proof industry, but there are some that are typically considered recession-resistant, so to speak. And that tends to be healthcare, education, financial services, legal services, even utilities, things you kind of can't go without. And those that are more at risk, I always say, well, think about yourself. If you need to cut back, what do you typically cut back on? It's the vacations, the trips, the, you know, the eating out. And so not surprisingly, that's where we tend to see layoffs in the beginning as well. So whether it's hospitality and leisure or tourism and travel, restaurants, even retail, you may not be shopping as much. Um, So we tend to see cuts there. My advice is always to just keep an eye on what's going on in the news. There's a great site that I tend to look at called layoffstracker.com. L-A-Y-O-F-F-S-T-R-A-C-K-E-R.com. And that, you can look at it globally, just in the U.S., tech companies versus non-tech companies. And I just keep a look at who's laying off people. And you will see it's across all sectors, but obviously some are hit more heavily than others. And that can give you some clues as to what may be safer and what may be more at risk in the coming months. It kind of mirrors, you know, the early pandemic essential and non-essential jobs, right? It's, It's the things you can't live without. 100%. I think the only difference this time around is that uh, the companies that had anything that was virtual gaming, virtual education, Disney Plus, Netflix, all those streaming services tended to do very well. And I think we're seeing actually those companies hurting more now because people are allowed outside and, and this recession is not associated with a lockdown. And so those industries, which did really well in the pandemic, are actually struggling a bit more in recent months. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, if you're cutting your budget, you're cutting out things like streaming services and exercise apps and and those things. Yeah. Yeah. Do I need seven subscriptions or could we go down to two and be okay? Could we? I know. It's like, how often do you watch all of them? Yeah. Exactly. You wrote an article recently for Fast Company about how to recession-proof your career. What are some steps that people can do to protect their jobs? Because if you're looking like, oh, well, I do work in tech, I do work in one of these non-essential things that might get cut, is there anything that you can do to kind of recession-proof your job? Sure. And again, I will always say there is no guarantee, but obviously we want to operate at our highest and prepare for the worst. And so in terms of trying to recession-proof or safeguard your job, some of the most important things are making sure people are aware of the good stuff you're doing, Um, especially, you know, if you end up working remotely. You want to make sure that people are aware of what you're working on, 
how it's aligned or ladders up into the greater goals for your department or the overall corporate goals. And then make sure they're aware of your successes, the progress you're making. And that includes your boss. Because I will say that, especially if you're one of many people that are reporting into the same individual, that person may not be aware of everything you truly handle, all the balls you're keeping up in the air. And so this is the time to be the squeaky wheel and make sure they're aware of what you're doing. So definitely become your own hype person, promote your own work. And a part of that, of course, is over communicating. And again, this is especially important if you tend to work remotely or in a hybrid environment that you want to make sure that you are keeping everybody in the loop about what's going on. If you don't have a regular meeting with your boss on a weekly or biweekly basis, perhaps it's time to either implement that, request it, or find other ways to more actively keep this person up to date with what's going on in your work. And then the other thing that I'd put out there that I think is really important is how can you be the biggest value add? How can you be, quote unquote, invaluable for the organization? Whether it's you're doing things to help cut costs or drive revenue, retain customers, whatever it might be. And even if you're not in a position where it's clear to see how your role impacts the bottom line, sales, easy, right? There are other roles, even if you're in operations, customer service, Where are you finding efficiencies? How many subscriptions to how many different tools and platforms are you using? And is there any way to either negotiate a lower cost or cut one of them off the list because you're not using it regularly? Um, How can you get a little leaner? Because I think that's always useful. How can you show that you are providing value and reducing costs? Those are always going to be really great selling points for keeping you around. And then the other half of being invaluable is being the person that people want to work with. So if everyone's starting to complain, and I get it, it's it's rough. I have been through it more than once. How can you present the positive attitude? When there's the task no one wants to take on, do you just bite the bullet and say, I got it? Um, because those are the people that the boss is going to remember when they're figuring out who to keep and who they're going to have to let go. And that definitely works in your favor. That's a great point. And as you're talking, I'm thinking like another thing that kind of makes somebody feel indispensable is that relationship building, right? Whether it's the relationships with your other coworkers, it's the, it's the one, you know, you're the person that everybody comes to and, and is the glue between the people or, you know, depending on your position in your industry, sometimes this is like an an old way to say it, but your Rolodex, right? All of the contacts that you have, like, oh no, if we let that person go, we're going to lose everybody else that she knows that she brings in all of your clients or all of your, you know, freelancers or all of your contacts. 100%. I think that's a great point because everyone should always be aiming to network, even if it's just within their organization. And you can have a small company, but that doesn't mean you know and have a good connection or relationship with everyone you work with. So I think it is getting to know what other people are working on and seeing where you can pitch in. I'm not necessarily insinuating that you need to pick up everybody's slack and that you become the doormat. That's not what I'm saying here. But it is about being proactive and looking for opportunities where you can pitch in and provide value and create those stronger bonds with other colleagues, whether it's within your department or even cross-functional, across business lines. If it means that you're creating more visibility for yourself, that there's more people that will think of you when they're getting together in a big group to look at who they're going to cut, the person they don't know, the person who's just a name on the sheet is a lot easier to lay off than the person that they've had meaningful conversations with and they've seen that person working hard for the organization. There's been some predictions made recently that have gotten some coverage that remote employees are going to be the, the first ones to let go if a company downsizes. Do you think there's merit to that idea? And does remote work make employees more vulnerable to being let go? And if someone is working remotely and they can't return to the office, you know, they relocated, what should they do? I think it could be a liability. I think it could be a risk for sure if you're working remotely. I will say that it's really going to depend on the culture of the organization. And I know that's not the answer everyone wants to hear because it's not very cut and dried, but I think it does depend on the company and the philosophy behind the company. Listen, if you have one of those executives that's been harping on bringing everybody back to the office for quite some time now, and they're trying to get everybody back in and kind of compromise with the hybrid, but you know it was begrudgingly, 
that's probably a company where you're a bit more at risk because we know what the head of that organization or who's ever managing that workforce, what they truly would prefer. So yes, proximity bias is probably going to play a big role here, meaning that managers assume if they can see you, you're performing better than those that are not in their line of sight, those that are working remotely. And so, yes, that can definitely play a role. I think in some instances, if the company is truly very hybrid or or there's a, a large percentage of the employees who are working from home, it's not going to be as much of an issue. And in fact, there might be a debate of well, it's cheaper if we don't have to pay for the space. Could we get a smaller office? Could we get rid of the office entirely? I work for a company that I think it will be a a year or maybe it's two years this December. We got rid of our office in Manhattan and everybody works remote. We are completely global at this time. Not every company is like that, obviously, but I think you are seeing more of that. So think about the philosophy behind the company and when they were switching to say a hybrid environment, what were those conversations like? And that's going to give you a sense as to whether or not it's going to, it, it could come back and hurt you. If you are remote, if you moved far away and there's no way you can come into the office, then I think it's really about how do you stay on the radar? How do you make sure people don't forget about you? How do you make sure you're included in the meetings? And I think that does have a lot to do with you have to put extra effort into building relationships with the various people that you work with that you want to make sure that you schedule the virtual coffee chat once a month with a few you know key people in your company because you want that kind of water cooler conversation that's not necessarily going to happen in a virtual environment because you want to make sure they don't accidentally or subconsciously leave you off an invitation or forget to share a piece of information because it could be intentional but a lot of times it's not they just forget because they're not seeing you And for those of you who can commute into the office and and typically choose not to, and you have that option, this would be the time that I'd I'd schedule some time to go into the office. I'm not saying you suddenly have to go back four days a week when the requirement is two or three days, but I would be very strategic about when I'm coming into the office. Only come in when you know there's other people coming in. Is your boss coming in that day? Are there other stakeholders? Are there other people that you're working on projects with, because that's when you want to be seen and you want to have those connections. It helps put faces with names. If nobody else is in and you're going in there to sit on your laptop and be in virtual meetings, what is the point? So really, if you are going to suck it up and and commute into the office, make sure it's worth your while because it's, it's strategically scheduled. I'm so glad you made this point because it's the point that I made when I heard it was, well, actually remote employees are cheaper. Like if you're looking to save money, don't fire somebody, get rid of the office. (laughs) Like, you know, that's uh, your rent in Manhattan costs a lot more than, you know, a couple employees salaries do. 100%. And even when they're hiring, right? If they're hiring people that live in areas where the cost of living is low, we're seeing a lot of companies, their compensation philosophy has to do with paying an average around the area where the person works. Well, if you're not forcing everyone to commute into a major metropolitan area, there's there's a little bit more flexibility there. Not that I'm saying I want everyone to do that, but... (laughs) I know. Yes, I'm definitely a proponent of paying people the same wage regardless of where they live. Agree. Choose an average and go with that, but I 100% agree. But unfortunately, not every employer is necessarily on that bandwagon right now. Yeah, but a smart company, if they're looking to to save costs, looks elsewhere, you know, other than than laying people off first. But it is it is obviously something that happens. Aside from the things you can kind of do to protect the job that you have, what are some things that people can be doing to prepare for a layoff if it does happen? Like, you know, you could do everything you can to kind of hold on to the job you have, but if it's inevitable and it's going to happen anyways, what kinds of things should people be doing? I think that's such a great question because I always say, you know, operate at your best, right? Perform at the highest level, but channel your inner scout, right? (laughs) Always be prepared. And that's so important. And I tend to harp on this a lot, regardless of what's going on in the economy, that you should always be prepared for a job search because things can change at a moment's notice. And if you haven't gathered all the information ahead of time that you're going to need to set up that resume, LinkedIn profile, prep for interview, whatever it is, you may not have access to that when you truly need it. And so this this is a great time. Even if you're feeling okay about your job, but you're concerned, 
regardless, if you're feeling really great about your job and industry, I would still recommend that everybody prepare for a job search. A few things are exploring your options. What companies are currently still hiring? What companies are not showing up in the headlines for laying people off? Go on LinkedIn. Who do you know in your network who has the hiring, you know, hashtag banner around their profile photo and just get a sense of what's out there and whether you may need to shift to another industry for a period of time or if your industry seems to still be going strong, but with competitors. Gather that information now so you can have a clearer understanding of what your goals should look like for this immediate job search should you need to go that route. And then the other is using that information to really kind of clarify those goals so that you can update your resume with all the most important information. I mention this in nearly every article I write, but I highly recommend everybody has a brag book. It could be a Google Doc. It could be notes on your phone. It could be a paper composition notebook. It doesn't matter, but the idea is that there's somewhere where you are keeping track of your professional accomplishments. When you hit a goal, when you finish a project under budget, on time, whatever it might be, when you get a promotion, when you get a raise, whatever it is, keep a log of all of those personal successes. A, it's great to flip through it when you're having a bad day. Remind yourself of how great you are when sometimes you don't feel so great. And then two, also you have all this great information that you might not have access to at another time that you can now leverage for that resume, that LinkedIn profile. So use that information to update your documents with this current goal in mind and make sure that you're taking all those great accomplishments and contributions. And I understand everyone's job is different, but if you're not at work for a week, what balls drop to the ground? Where do things fall short or where are there going to be gaps in what the company does because you're not around? So even if it's tasks, think about where you make a difference and that's what you want to update. This is the time to also, when you're looking at job descriptions, identify if the work that you want to do, there's suddenly a new skill that's popping up that you haven't had to develop, whether it's learning a new piece of technology or it's a softer skill, whatever it might be, This would be a good time to look for opportunities to maybe build that skill or build your knowledge around that subject matter. If it seems to keep popping up on job descriptions that you're interested in and would make sense for you. So you want to look for opportunities to fill any skill gaps that could affect your job search should you need to go into that job search mode right away. If you, especially if you're in a job for a while, the last time you updated your resume could have been a decade ago when you got that job, right? And so then it's like scrambling to try to remember everything you did. And that brag sheet, like you said, is valuable outside of just looking for a new job. I know we've given that advice before when you're, you know, if you want to get a raise or promotion to have that to be able to reference because it's so hard to remember even a month or six months or a year later, everything that you accomplished. 100%. And I think, especially for women, we sometimes find it hard to brag. We've been taught to be modest our entire lives. And you sometimes need that reminder of, look at all these amazing things you've done. Yeah, you're 100% worth this. Go fight for that race. Or yes, go into that interview confident, regardless of a layoff. And that's the thing I always remind people is that layoffs are not your fault. It's not synonymous with being fired. They had to cut costs. And you happen to be one of those individuals and you really have to not get hung up on that fact for sure. Yeah, that that can be a really difficult thing. I know that, you know, I was laid off in the recession of 2009 and I remember, like, I just kind of told, I felt horrible. Like it was the worst feeling in the world, but I remembered that literally right before I got laid off by somebody who I had never worked directly with, my direct boss had given me praise for some work that I had done. I literally got praise and then got laid off right after that. So it was like, I kind of tried to keep reminding myself, like, it was not your job performance. It was not your job performance. But it is hard not to, you know, take it personally. So that is really great advice to to have that praise, especially praise from other people, you know, if you don't believe it yourself. You know, you had said in your article, you gave this advice, which is something that I heard a lot when I was freelancing to embrace a portfolio career. So diversify your portfolio, not put all of your eggs in one basket. So if you are working and you're work, you know, at a full-time job and you're worried about a layoff, 
how do you go about having a portfolio career? Cause it can sound like, Oh my God, I have to have a side hustle and another job and it's going to be like so much work and I'm already working full time. What's the strategy there? It's certainly a challenge. And I'm, I will say it's not for everybody. And I completely get that. A lot of people have a lot of personal responsibilities outside of their job that are going to limit their ability to do this, but there are some little things you can do for sure. Of course, we always hear the, what's your personal hobby and can you make it an Etsy store? And that's for some people, 100%. But I think some of the easier ways are to really talk to your network and understand who might benefit from your services and just try one short little freelance gig. You know, there are so many sites you can use to advertise your services, but I would just start with your own network and say, whatever your specialty is, whether you're great at customer service, you're a wonderful writer, you're great at strategy, you're a spreadsheet ninja, whatever it might be, looking for opportunities where you're talking to people. Again, this should be important anyway, in case you have to go on into job search mode, but really start re-engaging with your network and catching up with people virtually or in person to get a sense of what's going on in their lives and see maybe where you could help out. And it's your way of testing, you know, is freelance really for me? Could I take a couple other side projects on and start small and see how it works out? This is especially great if you can target industries that are not the same as yours. So if your industry is at risk, taking on a writing freelance, you know, job, say for a financial publication as opposed to a tech publication or switching it up, you know, could be a great way to supplement your income while not necessarily putting too much unnecessary stress. I always say start small, give it a try, see what works for you, and then you can decide if you can go bigger with it. It could also be as simple as a mother and especially a mother of a child with special needs. Getting somebody to watch my child is impossible. (laughs) There's no one available. So it could be as simple as volunteering to, you know, watch your friends or your neighbor's kids on the weekend because they have a job where they have to work Saturdays or something like that. You can think of some very, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be what I would call resume boosting kind of jobs. It doesn't have to end up on your resume. The idea is that you are finding other ways to bring in revenue or bring in cash um, to your household that are not dependent upon your full-time job. And it it sounds like that's also a good way, you know, as you're you're talking about you know, preparing for your job search and thinking about different industries. I keep thinking about something that's uh, it's hard for a lot of people to see in themselves and maybe easier for them to see in other people, which is transferable skills, like figuring out what skills that you have in, in your current job, which maybe is an at-risk industry that are transferable to a totally different field. One of the, my favorite exercises that I do with clients who are interested in making a change is that we run an advanced search on LinkedIn for people that previously worked at their company or their competitors and have held previously like a similar type of title just to see where they've ended up and see what other industries have kind of accepted their experience. If you're truly unsure where your skills fit in, For instance, I worked at a job board for many, many years. And one of the things, if you didn't work there, you'd never know. But one of the industries we tended to pull a lot of people from was uh, dating websites because it was similar. They were both matching entities, we matching jobs, you know, employers and job seekers versus finding love matches. It was actually very similar. So a lot of our product and marketing people came from the dating dating site world. Um, Totally different, but actually very similar. You will see some of those if you start looking at people's histories. And then I think it's also about talking to people. Who do you know who's left your industry and calling them up and just saying, you're not looking for them to suddenly give you all these consulting services for free. It's more, hey, I'm thinking about making a move. I saw that you ended up at this company. Could I ask you a few questions about how did that work out? What did you find was most important? Those sorts of things. Those informational interviews I find are highly underutilized by professionals, but they're so incredibly valuable because I could list off all of the regular transferable skills, your communication skills, ability to use certain technology, a lot of the soft skills such as, you know, being adaptable, flexible, willing to learn. All those things are important, but they could kind of be used anywhere. If you're looking for very specifically what from your 
line of work could be transferred somewhere else where it's not just I'm selling here and I'm going to sell there instead. The informational interviews can be really, really useful. Yeah, that's such a great tip. And I think that people are much more willing to give informational interviews than do you have any job openings? Like I'm asking you for something like I'm just asking you to like tell me about your career and like people like to talk about themselves, you know, so you'll probably get 15 minutes on that. That's fascinating about the dating website to a job board. It makes sense, but it's not something that you would immediately think of for sure. Yeah. I mean, all of our salespeople, because we were selling, right, you know, they were all recruiters. They were all previously recruiters. Why? Because they know HR people. They know other recruiters. They know how to talk the talk. And frankly, recruiters are salespeople in another sense. So I think, again, it's you may not know that off the top of your head, but if you start looking, look at former colleagues who have moved on, where have they gone? And just look at even second connections, because you can always ask for an introduction. And I agree that if you go into any meeting expecting to ask for a job or a job offer or a job lead. That's something that's more challenging for people to be able to deliver upon. Rule number one, when you're doing, you know, phone sales is you always ask questions in the beginning where they can say yes to, you don't want to put them in the the no mindset because you don't want to shut them down. You're not asking them for anything they can't supply. They're just sharing their experiences. If you get a job leave out of it, great. But rule number one with informational interviews is you never go in expecting that type of outcome. For sure. I mean, and people can read through it anyways, if you're like, oh, I'm just using you to get something out of you. Yeah. My last question is about those left behind, you know, the, the survivor's guilt for the people, you know, if they're, you know, and, and I've been in this position before, and I think a lot of people, you know, you spend any amount of years in a career and, and you've experienced it and it's awful as well, you know, when there's a large layoff and you we're lucky enough to not be part of it, but you're left behind. Sometimes it means you're left doing a lot more work. Your workload doubles because now you've taken on other people's jobs, but you also maybe feel really guilty about it or, you know, you have that survivor's guilt or you feel like, oh my God, it's still coming. Like it's not over. What's your advice to the kind of those left behind and after a layoff? Yeah, I've been through that a few times at this point in my career and it, it's never fun. It definitely isn't. The one thing, I've learned or at least made me feel better was to reach out to those I I knew who had been laid off that I had a connection with and really, you know, send them a message says, you know, I'm so sorry to hear this happen. Please know my network is yours. If you see anybody that I'm connected to that you'd like me to introduce you to, I'm happy to do so. Given that I'm a certified professional career coach and resume writer, obviously I have a few other things I can throw out. So I did, you know, I have reached out to people and said, If you want to brainstorm, if you want to sit down one day and go through your resume together, your LinkedIn profile, you know, I'm happy to do that with you. Obviously, not everyone's going to be able to do that. But if you have certain expertise that would be beneficial in a job search, offering it up. But I think it's basically showing support and offering up what you have to offer, whether it's connections, resources, information, being willing to check in. You know, some people don't want to talk right away. And I always say, yeah, if you've been laid off and you're upset, Take the week or so to grieve and then come back with fresh eyes and a fresh start and and start that job search. So maybe it's checking in with them at the end of the month or something and scheduling time to check in with them. I think that helps with a bit of the guilt. I have seen people, I haven't done this personally, but depending on how you use LinkedIn, I've seen people who, you know, basically announced what happened and tagged their friends and kind of endorsed them. You can always do the endorsements on LinkedIn. You can offer to write a recommendation or, you know, serve as a reference. So I think anything you can show to support them. And then for yourself, when you're in that mode, because now you're left and chances are your work is doubling and you're still concerned you'll be next. So you don't really want to slack off, but it can be very stressful. I think it's really important to try and find those boundaries because you don't want to burn out and, and we're going into holiday season. So, you know, there's going to be extra stress anyway. So let's keep that in mind. I think it's really important to a put some boundaries on that. You're going to agree with yourself to clock out at certain times, whether you're working from home or going into an office to have an open and honest conversation with your boss about any, about your concerns. And that obviously I want to do a good job, but there's only so much I can accomplish. And so it may be talking about, I need your help informing me what's the priority right now. I have X amount of time available. There are five projects on my plate and feasibly I can get three done in their timeframes and two are going to have to be pushed off 
what should I be focusing on? So it's not necessarily saying, can I have more time? And they, they can say yes or no. It's more, this is what I know I can accomplish. What's most important to you? And some things are either going to have to be dropped, they're going to be put on the back burner, or they're going to just have to be um, given a later deadline sort of thing. And I get not every boss is going to have that great conversation, but that's a sign maybe that you should be getting everything ready because they should be understanding. Um, so I think that's helpful. And then finding an outlet outside of work, whatever it might be. Are you a runner? Do you meditate? Do you paint? Do you play in whatever it might be that helps you get frustration and energy out and allows you to feel good, you have to make time for that because you have to take care of the whole of you. And that includes your, your well-being, your mental health, your physical health. Um, because if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to perform at work anyway. Those are all fantastic pieces of advice because there are so many different emotions and different like things you need to address when, when kind of surviving a layoff. Amanda, thank you so much for joining me. I think there's been so many great tips that, you know, people can be thinking about if they're worried about a recession, worried about a layoff, or just kind of want to do their best in their career. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Kate. And that's all for this episode. If you're a new listener, be sure to subscribe to The New Way We Work wherever you listen. And if you like this episode, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And we want to hear from you. Did you lose your job in the last recession? How worried are you about the looming recession now? Email us at podcast at fastcompany.com or tweet us with the hashtag The New Way We Work. And don't forget to listen to our special four-part series, Ambition Diaries, in this feed. You can also head to fastcompany.com slash ambition hyphen diaries for photos, interviews, and audio clips from all seven mothers and daughters in the series. The New Way We Work was produced by Joshua Christensen with editing by Nicholas Torres. Thank you.